All right, everybody, welcome to the Sherman Show. I am Jeff Sherman. I'm here with my co-host, Sam Lau. Hey, hey. And today we have a returning guest to the Sherman Show. It's none other than Nancy Davis. Welcome to the show, Nancy. Thanks for having me back, guys. Absolutely. And so for those of you who don't recall, uh, Nancy Davis is the founder of Quadratic Capital. She founded it back all the way back in 2013. Um, and uh, she has since then launched two ETFs that exploit uh, what's going on within the volatility space um, and inflation and deflationary themes. And so uh, I think the last time we met, Nancy, it was right on the cusp of you launching uh, your well-known strategy, Eyeball. Is that correct? Yes, we met uh, literally, it was uh, like two days before the fund actually listed on the New York Stock Exchange. So you guys were my first podcast, and uh, I really appreciate your you know, long-term support of, uh, of Quadratic and me. So thanks for having me on today. No, absolutely. And, you know, um, it's it's funny how we sit here, you know, a few years later, and now we're in the ETF business as well, too. We have our own ETFs as well. So, um, you know, it's kind of a merger of these worlds together. But um, maybe you could give us an update since the last time we spoke, too. You were talking about you know, was very interesting about iVol. Maybe you could talk about thematically what that strategy is trying to capture out there. And again, just uh, as you think about, you've done some more development of new strategies launched in the space, how those things work together. Yeah, so um, iVol has kind of been, I would say, a career-long passion of mine. Um, when I was, uh, I spent about 10 years at Goldman Sachs. And when I started my career in the late 90s as a, as a trader, it was right when the U.S. Treasury invented the TIPS market. So TIPS being Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, they didn't start until uh, 1997. I think I always like to, you know, shake people and say, like, just don't look at what happened in the 70s because the interest rate derivative markets, even the inflation protected bond markets didn't exist back then. So you don't want to have, you know, I call it your grandmother's inflation, <laughs> where a lot of people look at uh, the commodity markets or real estate or cyclical equities, other kind of things that existed back then um, without looking at something so simple like the inflation markets or the interest rate markets. And so I've always kind of just, uh, you know, I've never thought tips made a ton of sense on their own. Um, I've always kind of had a, a beef with the Treasury for creating it. It's like in name only, but they're bonds. Um, they have, uh, you know, duration exposure. So some professional investors will try to isolate the break even, which is the implied uh, future CPI price um, to hedge out the duration. But then you just have, you know, CPI inflation, which is my other problem with tips, is I just don't think uh, the consumer price index is the only way to think about inflation. Like nobody in the equity market would ever buy the Dow Jones index and say, ta-da, I got it, I have inflation. And the CPI is something that even, even the Fed doesn't use it. Um, so it's just not the only way to think about how to measure inflation, especially with the, you know, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, today's Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day, both of you. And uh, today um, the CPI uh, came out and also the new weights came out um, recently with the Bureau of Labor Statistics. They create this uh, the CPI basket. And about a third of it is, is you know, owner-occupied rent in the form of shelter. And so having so much of the basket be rent, I just don't think it's the only way to think about inflation. Yeah, no, it's, it's funny you mentioned that because Sam's always telling me I'm supposed to give the date at the top of this for compliance purposes. So thanks for reminding us. Um, we'll, I'll, I'll say it officially that today is Valentine's Day. It's February 14th, 2023. So thanks, Nancy, for the reminder. And I yep. was hoping that you would send us some of your Valentine's hats back there. Pink, they got a heart <laughs> on them, loving volatility as well. But it, it is amazing. You, you mentioned this about the inflation, too, because there was not only just the new weights, but there was also revisions to the seasonal adjustments that came out last week, right? And so we saw those adjustments automatically made Jay Powell's job more difficult because all of a sudden now the inflation rates went up. Yeah. Uh, due or at least in, they're in the going world. the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. You wanna, who's going to get fired at the Bureau of Labor Statistics? I don't know, but you know, someone. 
Yeah, maybe that's why uh, Brainerd finally announced that she's leaving uh, the Fed. She's moving on to be, you know, at the council uh, or an economic advisor to the White House. So, although yep. there's been rumblings of that for a while, though, so I don't think it was. Con I don't think it's. Uh, I think it's spurious correlation to the whole um, the whole uh, seasonal adjustment thing here. But you know, so uh, when you think about that, you say that CPI is not the only way to measure it. And like once you start looking at the inflation data, it, it's just massively mind boggling, right? There's like the social security inflation that we use the, for the COLA adjustments. There's the healthcare baskets, right, that we use for the Medicare receipts too. Um, so when you think about that, how do you think about inflation, right? So it's one thing to say, well, CPI is not really indicative of how one of us may think about it, but how do you, Nancy Davis, think about it? Well, that's that's why we, we created the Eyeball ETF. It's designed to try to fix some of the issues that I see with with tips alone, which is a tips only get reset with the consumer price index and whether the BLS is changing the weights or adjusting this or that, it's just one index, right? It's not the only way to think about inflation. So we take a core tips portfolio, about 85-ish percent of the fund typically is invested in that type of treasury bond. And then we try to solve the problem with, you know, it only being CPI that's reset with tips. And then also the issue with all tips are bonds and all bonds will lose money with uh, higher interest rates. So we designed a product that has that, you know, asymmetric payoff. So when long dated yields go higher and bonds lose money, our goal is not to hedge it. Our goal is to make money off of it, to make money off of when inflation expectations increase and people demand you know, more yield to lend Janet Yellen more money, <laughs> you know, when you're lending to the, U you know, the U.S. interest rate swap curve has never been this inverted in the history of the swaps market data going back to the 80s. Um, yeah. It's currently, you know, it's after the market closed February 14th, CPI out this morning. The curve, the spot curve on the 210 swap curve is currently negative. 121 basis points. So what that means is that, you know, you lend the U.S. money uh, and for 10 years and you get paid 1.21 percent less to lend money longer. That is a not normal environment. And I'm, I'm looking forward to kind of diving into why that is. But I think that's a very simple way to look at investors expectations for return of capital for what's going to happen in the the equity market has had, you know, overall a decent, you know, start of the year. A lot of people were predicting recession, credit spreads. If you look at IG, they're about, you know, caught 70 basis points. So credit and equities are behaving like maybe, you know, maybe things are okay. The yield curve is trading like, uh, you know, there are UFOs in the sky and it's like the end of the world. It's a uh, zombie apocalypse time because it's, it's never been this inverted for this long in the history of the swaps market data, which at least in my Bloomberg terminal, I see it going back to the late 80s, which is even before the tips market started in the late 90s. Yeah, well, also you can go back and look at, you know, kind of treasury market data too, and you can see it in the in the late 70s. We did get a little more inverted than this, but it's a little more inverted. Um, but on a significantly higher base, right? You're talking like 14, 15% rates when you had that kind of approaching 3% inversion. And so well, one thing you'd mentioned too is talking about inflation. And I thought it was very important because you talked about the market's inflation expectations, right? Because people are seeing inflation out there right now. But what we've seen in these kind of higher, you know, year over year prints in the back half of last year is that actually, the treasury market on the back end of the curve rallied, right? And rates yeah. actually came down. And so what 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 do you think what do you make of that? Um, and then let's just dig into the question you teed up for yourself, right? What do you make of this deep inversion of the curve today? Yeah, you know, a couple things. I, I do think inflation is a global phenomenon. It's not just in the US. And I think there's a tremendous amount of confidence built in that the Fed hiking policy rates is gonna ease future inflation expectations. So maybe before we touch the curve, just the break-even market, you know, even though today's CPI print, you know, was, uh, you know, you could say higher or lower, it doesn't really matter. It, it's above, you know, 2.3, 2.5, which is where break-evens are 
out in the future. So the expectations for future CPI prints is all kind of right around that 2.3, 2.5, 2.8. If you get really short term, it's not anywhere near realized inflation, which today was 6.4. And I think that's because the consensus is definitely that the Fed's got this, that the Fed hiking policy rates is going to kill future inflation, and it's being priced in. So the market is very comfortable that the Fed has got this under control and that they have been aggressive enough or hawkish enough with their rate hikes, and even more hikes got priced in today after the CPI print. I now see 63 basis points of additional hikes in the first half of this year in 23. So Which the is Fed the highest terminal rate we've seen to date, right? The market got there kind of in October when we had a higher back end of the curve rates, right? The terminal rate was higher, but today is the highest we've seen in the cycle again. So uh, definitely the market's trying to say, wait a second, maybe there is something about this kind of lingering inflation going on. But as you said, it's not permeated into these like break-even curves, which are much farther out than, let's say, what we're talking about, Fed fund futures rates. Yeah, but even things like the uh, the five-year um the five-year, five-year, the five-year uh, forward inflation rate, like uh, all these things are around hugging 2%. So I think the Fed has done a great job of, you know, I wouldn't say they got inflation right, but they have convinced the market that they are going to kill future inflation expectations. And that's where, like, I'm excited to be back on your podcast because I want to, I feel like I want to stand on my soapbox and be like, shake everybody and be like, it is time to buy inflation protection because it is on sale. It's really cheaply priced. Like whether you think inflation is going to be, you know, three, four, you know, anything above, you know, call it two and a half, or I'm just looking at the five year break even, you know, it's priced there. So I think it's a good time for investors to be looking outside a, you know, kind of more you know, things that people, everybody back tests in this industry. And I know you guys, you know, see this a lot and are really out of the box thinkers. But I think the problem is a lot of these passive indices that managers are benchmarked to, whether it's the ag index or other things like the ag has no inflation protection in it. No, no tips are in the ag at all. Zero, which, you know, how can that be core fixed income? if They don't have any. It's not it's not diversified. And then a third of the index is mortgages and um you know we can get into the vol aspect in a second but i do think it's a uh the us has one of the uh kind of lowest break even markets around the world like the the uk is about a percent higher um even germany has higher inflation than us in terms of break evens and then our swap curve is even more inverted than the nominal treasury curve. So, Jeff, to your point, there is treasury data that goes back farther than the swap market before the late 80s. But the, you know, today I see the uh, twos tens nominal treasury curve at negative 86, whereas the twos tens swap market, which is a, you know arguably a much larger larger market in terms of, uh, of size in the market, it's negative 1.2%. So it's, you know, significantly cheaper than where the treasury market is, even more inverted. And I think that's, that's leverage, right? It's, it's everybody, you know, whether it's UK pension funds or whoever, it's people don't want to always necessarily fund with cash in the treasury market. And then some people repo it out, but it's a, uh, it's a cost of balance sheet. Yeah, one more thing on that before I let let Sam jump into some of his line of questioning too is, you know, there's this belief that the the Fed and you said it too that the Fed will be able to kill inflation with these rate hikes that are in the system. And I'm, I'm not going to give all my opinions. Everybody's heard them so much as of late. But um, but is is also what you're getting kind of from this shape of the curve? Is it also the bond market say you're going to kill inflation by killing growth? Right. And so, the, you know, so it's kind of be careful what you wish for on that side. How do you think about that? And, and let's dig into what do you think about the signal that you're getting from both the Treasury market curve as well as the swaps curve? Well, it's always chicken or egg, right? Does the yield curve predict a recession? Does it cause a recession? Like it, it, nobody really knows, but they're definitely 
correlated. And I would say, you know, the big problem that I see with, uh, you know, this massively inverted curve, whether you're looking at the swaps or the treasury curve, it really doesn't encourage lending, right? The Fed doesn't extend credit. They can, you know, hike policy rates, they can reduce their balance sheet with quantitative tightening, they can increase their balance sheet with QA, but they don't lend money. And I think the problem is, is like, you know, very simply, if you can, you know, lend money to the Fed overnight and get four and a half percent with no risk, why would you ever lend money to longer dated when you get paid less? Because everything is based off where swap rates are in the market. So you've had, you know, this, this massively inverted yield curve, like just looking at the 10 year treasury right now, it's massively below where a T-bill is. And that's, you know, investors lending the US government money, but why would you lend companies money and get paid less in the future? So I think it's a, a problem where often people can, you know, kind of uh, correlate a, a normal upward sloping yield curve to bank lending and health in the financial market. And it's really unclear, like, does the inverted yield curve break break the financial system? Because the whole premise of like banks and lending, you know, even with all the direct lending and private credit out there now, is that you, you borrow short term, you lend long term, right? And when you have an inverted yield curve, that equation doesn't work. Um, so the the rates market is definitely priced for, you know, Armageddon, you know, total recession being priced in. It's uh, it's very, you know, very kind of unhealthy where, but that's a totally different signal than what you're getting from credit markets, which are credit spreads are pretty contained. You know, there's not a lot of, uh, you know, IG spreads around 70 basis points. It's pretty, pretty, you know, if you own credit, you want tighter credit spreads. Um, and they're pretty tight already in context of the history. Um, so I think it's a it's a tough situation, and it's hard for investors to kind of know which market's right. But I do think the you know there are not many things in the financial markets that you can own today that are trading at valuation levels below the 80s. Um, and inside Ival, you know we own uh, you know essentially options on the steepness of the curve, and with the curve massively inverting, you could see a lot of scenarios that could normalize the curve, right? It could be just more of a of a risk on environment where people say, I don't need to own all these all this 10 year, uh, you know, 10 year paper and I'm going to sell it and take, you know, other other types of more risky assets. Or it could be the Fed doesn't hike the 63 basis points that's priced in in the next six months and they, you know, something bad happens and they either don't hike as much as what's priced in or they start to cut rates. So there are a lot of um, scenarios, but I think right now this is not normal. This is a unusual time for such a massively inverted yield curve. It's never been this low in the history of the swaps market going back to the 80s. It's never stayed this inverted for this long. And the market is definitely, uh, you know, confused because you have credit and equities and then the rates market saying, you know, it's totally different worlds. Like it's like, One's Mars, one's Venus. <laughs> yeah, what's funny? I told Sam he was going to be able to talk, and I cut him off here because you know I, I've been. I always struggle with this, and everybody says we're going to have a steepener, and I'm like, I know what a steepener looks like in an upward sloping curve, but when we're inverted, like, is the steepener really the flattener, or does it get more steep? And I, I know what you mean, like the trade. Yeah, it's just less well. inverted. I guess it's, it's where. Inverted. It actually flattens, right? But if you call it a flattener, then everybody's going to do the wrong trade, right? Yeah, so, it's really true. It's so amazing, you know. the jargon is really, really challenging. I guess what I mean is that people, you know, are are getting paid more to own uh, to put the money at the Fed versus taking duration risk to own long dated bonds. Like that, that's not normal, right? It's more normal that if you lend money longer to anybody, the U.S. government or you know anyone that you would expect to get paid at least the same, which is 120 basis points away from where we are now, <laughs> which is crazy. Yeah, you almost have to start using hand signals here for the uh, the steepener, flattener, and show people where we're going, which works on the video. So for those uh, people who are just listening on the podcast part, you can tune into the YouTube and check out uh, Sherman's little hand signals there. 
they're not gang signs, but they're hand signals. So yeah, you know, we should do uh, a, like it's like <laughs> YMCA here. <laughs> yeah. But it's, I wanted to take it to the flip side of this inflation coin. Um, you know, you, you're talking about Fed expectations or mm -hmm. uh, that are being you know implied through the the break evens, and that the Fed has it. You know, they've got this under control. And then you kind of you know Sherman laid in the segue for. Um, you know, perhaps the, the Fed going a little bit too far and breaking the economy. But one of the, the you know, the, the concepts that have been you know, starting to, to, to creep up a little bit more now is deflation. You know, the Fed perhaps going a little bit too far, crushing inflation too far and the economy and setting us into a period of deflation. Um, so, I mean, we just came off the, the recent highs of around 9% on CPI on a year over year basis last year. Mm -hmm. Do you think we're more likely to see a repeat of that level, that near-term high, or are we more likely to see deflation in, let's say, the next few years? And if so, like, uh, which which of those two would be, you know, the, the greater risk, a, a repeat of the of the the high levels of inflation that we saw in 2022, or deflation? I think they're both risks for investors, and that's you know. Part of the reason, like because of client requests, some investors do think that there's no way out, that we're the US is going to become Japan and we're going to have, you know, we have demographics are not working against us, there's too much debt, and uh, you know, the there's no gonna be no growth and the Fed's just going to kill it. And so because of uh, that that client demand and our expertise at Quadratic, we did list a deflation fund. Um, it's called BNDD. And I do not know <laughs> whether we're going to have inflation or deflation. I do think both of those things are risks to investors. But I think that's a, the beautiful thing about ETFs is I think of them as like Lego blocks. You know, people people can build their own castle with whatever Legos they want, you know, and, and have their own views about whether we're going to be in inflation or deflation. I think that's a nice thing about ETFs is you can give people access to strategies in a single QSIP product that they can express whatever view they have. Like they could also be, you know, super, I don't know, deflationistas, right? And they have a ton of, you know, whatever tech stocks and other things to express that view and they still might want eyeball in case they're wrong you know because you don't want to have everything in the portfolio lose money at the same time that's the whole point of diversification so i think it's i i i can make a case pretty easily for why we could have inflation short term and deflation long term um i can make I can make arguments the other way too. There, but but the reality is like no one really knows, right? We can we can all be macro pundits and talk to death about what we think is going to happen. But I think you know if we February fourteenth, twenty twenty three, if we rewind twelve months ago and we were at you know February fourteenth, twenty twenty two, I think most of most people in the room wouldn't have said that the Fed would have hiked. 450 basis points in a 12 month period, right? Less than 12 month period. So I think it's really very hard to predict what policymakers are gonna do, where global markets are going to do. You also have, it's not like a, not we don't live in a bubble, right? We have the Bank of Japan, we have them still doing, uh, you know, yield curve control. Um, did you know that the US uh, yield curve is massively inverted, but Japan's yield curve is actually positive, even though they're doing uh, yield curve control. So their um, their two ten swap market is sixty five basis points positive, even though ours is massively one hundred and twenty basis points negative. So I think it is a, a global market. There's a lot of capital around the world. There's been a lot of money printing with years and years and years of QE, and we have kind of divergent central bank policies right now with the Bank of Japan still being dovish, still buying bonds, and then you have other central banks like the Fed, the ECB, the Bank of England, Bank of Canada that have been more hawkish. But I think it's a nice thing about ETFs is people have access to whatever view they need for their portfolio, and it's not necessarily about being right, it's about being diversified and giving, you know, bettering client outcomes and giving them choices about whether they think there's going to be whatever in the portfolio. And they might be positioned 
for deflation, for instance, but they still might want to own eyeball just in case they're wrong, <laughs> you know? So we're, we're seeing, uh, you know, I think it's all about giving people choices and not trying to predict what's going to happen in the future, just giving really differentiated uh, instruments so people can, can build their own, own castle with their Lego blocks. That's how I see ETFs. <laughs> Well, I, I'm not I'm not as creative as you, Nancy. So I, I need the instruction manual, you know, to, to build the castle. I can't just build my own. I have to build what's in the box. It's right. Open. We've all been um, programmed by like Lego kits, not you know building blocks, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I got the wrong side of the brain or something going on there. But um, yeah. you know, I, I've been joking with people. It's like, well, you know, maybe the bank of Japan's absolutely right. Maybe inflation is indeed transitory. It's just we're using the wrong time frame, and they're going to be proven right at the end of the day um and you know look they've had less of the inflation but they've always they've taken on the side of the currency um but I, i'm trying to really distill down this divergence that you you referred to as well i was thinking about that when you were talking about where we see credit spreads in corporate bonds we see equity prices and multiples they completely seem to be giving a different signal than what you're seeing in the rates market and, you know, a lot of people give the bond market credit, you know, the rates market said that, you know, it, it's the smarter one or it gets things right. I mean, it's, it's all forecasting at the end of the day. We, we all struggle with it. But as you think about that, like, ha, do you recall such a divergence? I, I don't even remember this in, in any point in my career where we've seen something like this. And, you know, so, you know, the question then becomes, you know, is, is it the rates market, you know? Is it just the rates market trying to bully the Fed to say you're too tight, you need to cut more? Is the rate market being stubborn? Is everybody too ebullient about everything else? Like, I, how are you kind of shaking out all this? I know it's a, you know, you can give me, it's a 60 40, you can give me something else. It doesn't have to be one's right versus the other. But how, how are you thinking about that? And what positioning is kind of signaling to you? Yeah, I, I Jeff, same as you. I've never seen this kind of divergence between markets happen before. And it's weird because so many people, like a lot of a lot of equity people will track credit spreads. Like I think since the financial crisis, there's been a lot of, you know, co-bangling with people watching different markets. But right now you have, you know, corporate markets, whether it's corporate credit or equities, right? It's all corporate risk, part of the different parts of the capital structure, right? But the corporate market is like, Things are fine, you know, not a problem. Uh, FOMO, maybe that's what's going on. Whereas the the rates markets are, you know, are just, you know, completely screaming, right? That it is screaming. And so I think I think that's one of the things I love so much about Eyeball, because I feel like you don't have to be necessarily right on how the curve steepens, right? The the steepening or going back to our hand signals, the less inversion, right? It could just be more of a normal environment. It could be people just saying, hey, we're not going to have like the biggest recession we've ever seen in our lifetime and things are going to be okay, <laughs> right? You could see a more normal environment playing out, not like a tail risk, right? You don't need, you know, stagflation or inflation or runaway inflation expectations. You just need more normal. And I think that that's attractive because I think a lot of people are not playing for a more normal environment in the rates market, at least the equity and credit markets are trading more normal. Um, so I think that's a good opportunity. And then if there is, you know, really bad times ahead, you know, the yield curve does traditionally steepen when there's something bad happening, right? Uh, you know, you can go back to the 50s if you use the treasury curves and look at the periods of steepening going back to the 50s, it's always been when uh, when there is a recession, when the Fed is forced to cut rates or not hike as much in today's environment. And so I feel like having the steepener exposure could be a really nice potentially risk off trade. Whereas if you have a portfolio with a bunch of corporate risk, right, whether it's stocks or their corporate bonds and corporates have a problem, meaning like say there's higher labor costs or supply side disruptions or, you know, um, you know, other, you know, the Fed killing demand by hiking policy rates. So you have kind of that corporate beta. So I see it as a really 
different, not not better, but different way of adding spread risk to the portfolio and it's interest rate spread risk, which happens to be trading at levels from, you know, even lower than the 80s. And there are not many things that are trading at valuation levels that are so cheap and that can have, you know, whether it's normal, whether it's risk on, whether it's, you know, runaway inflation expectations, whether it's a recession, there are a lot of reasons that the yield curve can become less inverted and normalized that are not, you know, tail events. So I think it's super attractive, but it's also been like inverting over and over and over again. It's just been, it's hard to buy things. I think that's one problem with our industry with asset management is it's hard to buy stuff when it's going down, right? It's like everybody wants to buy high and sell higher, right? That's the, the mentality. Um, and so it's tough because it is kind of very, very contrarian because the yield curve has been falling massively. Inflation expectations have been falling with the Fed hiking policy rates. Vol has been falling too, which is really interesting. Um, last year, volatility rose in interest rates, but this year we've had about in six weeks, call it approximately, we've had about 50% of the rally in rate volatility reverse. So volatility is, you know, much cheaper than it was at the beginning of the year. And mm -hmm. IVAL has exposure to all three, the, the real yields lower from the tips, the exposure to the steepness or less inversion of the curve <laughs> to use our hand signals, and also the um, long volatility because we're buying interest rate options. So we are long rate vol. Right. So uh, putting that all together too and thinking about it, like as, as I think about rate vol, you know, um, it, it's, you know, a lot of people have, have blamed the equity market uh, vol, like a VIX on the launching of the shorter and shorter tenor of options trades. So it used to be like quarterlies, you know, I, I was asking to some of our older uh, equity traders and they were saying, yeah, they used to be quarterly. I was like, well, I think as long as I've been around, they've been monthly. Um, yeah. But, you know, there, there started to be these kind of bi-monthly, then they went to weekly. Now we're talking about zero data expiry type of options. And so there, there's been some folks that have claimed that potentially that is kind of dampening vol. But we don't have the same equivalence when we talk about interest rate volatility. Right. There's like the move index, which is, you know, again, the, the one we call for options ball. Um, you know, people look at it sometimes through mortgage spreads. You, you, you talked about this. So I'm, I'm, we're going to get a little nerdy here and talk about, you know, selling ball. That's essentially what an agency mortgage trade can be uh, distilled down to as well. But what, what do you think is driving some of this? Is just we had too much elevated vol last year or it just, to me, it feels like, the, you know, we have this symmetry in the inflation deflation risk still right now. So why has vol precipitously fell? Is it that people are buying the narrative that, you know, look, it's all behind us. The Fed's going to slow down. Therefore, rates will just normalize. Everything's going to be great. Well, what is kind of your, what, what is your intuition tell you? What is your analytical side tell you? Well, maybe let me just start that I think most, most, bond investors have no idea that they're short fixed income volatility. Like I, I'd start with that as a premise. Like I, I try to stand on my soapbox and create, you know, at Quadratic, these differentiated products. I'm not talking like VIX, equity vol, you know, all the weekly, daily, all those options get all the attention, right? But the, the, the kind of the, the, the monster in everyone's closet is actually in their bond portfolios because any place, and, and you said it well, Jeff, any place it's sometimes called, you know, prepayment risk or sometimes called negative convexity. But very simply, when you think about it, an owner of a financial mortgage is short options to U.S. homeowners because U.S. homeowners are long the option to prepay whenever they want. So they are long the option. And whenever you're short an option, you're short vol. And so I think the big problem that I see is that most investors, because of the move to passive indexing and because we had low yields for so long, the passive indices, which are market cap weighted, which, you know, now I'm doing the like gun to the head. It makes no sense in the, in the interest rate markets because it just buys up more and more duration, right? And so you look at things like the ag index, no inflation protection, 
a third of the index approximately is mortgages, which are short interest rate fixed income volatility because of that prepayment risk. And I just don't think that's the only way for bond investors to be is for short vol, especially, and this is where I want to like, you know, drum roll, like, got to look at the Fed's balance sheet, man. <laughs> you know, you got to look at it. It's $8 trillion. You know, they, they increased, um, everybody's so fixated, all the macro pundits out there on the Fed hiking rates, right? How many times are they going to hike? When are they going to cut? Like, that's the only thing we ever hear about. But what about the balance sheet? It's over eight trillion dollars. The 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 Soma Holdings is around eight trillion dollars. That's a piece of the Fed's balance sheet that was actually bought in the open market through their QE purchases. If you look at, you just Google it for those listening. Just Google S O M A, not like you know, it's not like Soho, but Soma, which is a system open market account. That's a piece of the Fed that goes out and buys bonds in the open market. And the Soma Holdings increased more in the eight weeks after the start of the pandemic than the previous nine years of quantitative easing during the financial crisis since 08. So, so Nancy, I got I to gotta tell you that, uh, you know, the West Coast, we have envy of your Sohos and things. So they tried to change the name in San Francisco to the South of Market, try to be Soma. Ah, okay. So people that like go in that area and think of the Fed's open market operation that they have there, uh, but again, not that um, Soma. It's other yeah. Soma. But yeah, it's it's a monster in the closet that people need to be aware of. They need to be aware of where they have uh, that embedded short fixed income volatility. I feel like equity vol always gets all the attention because. Anybody, anybody can trade an equity option, right? You can do it on your iPhone, you can do it on Robinhood. Like it's very easy to access the listed options market. Um, even things like the move index, that's listed treasury options, right? You, you guys know, like nobody, nobody uses like, the treasury option is like a, a teeny tiny part of the swaptions market, which is a bigger market. Um, so it's not the swaptions market vol, it's not, prepayment risk, it's not the way mortgages are, you know, priced, it's all uh, model based. And it's a, it's an OTC market. And I think that's where ETFs can really help by giving uh, QCIP, single QCIP access to markets that investors can't necessarily own on their own, right. Um, and I think it's super important, especially given when you look at those, not, not the SOMA, you know, San Fran world, but when you look at the SOMA holdings, a third of the holdings are mortgages, right? And that big buyer is out of the market, prepayments are down because interest rates are higher, and what are they going to do? <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's um, I feel like too much focus right now is only on predicting what's priced in, how many hikes, and people are just ignoring that that big monster out there that most regular people, like I'm just talking like people who have 60, 40 portfolios, most regular people are short fixed income ball, not equity ball. Yeah. And that's one of the things too, it seems like, you know, when you're talking about the, the balance sheet there, that's something that Jay Powell has definitely been trying to avoid as well. I can't remember the, the name of the uh, publication of the last question at the presser. It was an interesting name of the publication, but uh he asked a question about QT and the expectations there. And Punchbowl the news. Punchbowl Punch news. That's I, it. I said it on my webcast and uh, one of our colleagues said it because I called it like circus news or something. So <laughs> no disrespect to Punchbowl news out there, but it's, that's the first time I'd heard of them. Yeah, no, I feel like the balance sheet is like, it's like Voldemort, right? It's like he should, it's like you can't talk about it. You can't name it. You There's no discussion about it. The caps, you know, doubled in the fall and there's no clarity on what they're going to do with that. And um I think the market just needs to be, people should pay attention more to that, what's going on there and the implications to their bond portfolios. And that's kind of my, you know, again, standing on my soapbox and there's very little innovation in the financial industry, right? There's like a lot of people do the same things. They have the same benchmark. They might be passive, active, you know, whatever. There's nothing wrong with a passive product. There's nothing wrong with an active product. But when you all have the same benchmark, 
and a third of it is short volatility in the bond portfolio, I want people to be aware of that. And that's what I've been trying to communicate. And part of the reason, you know, I founded my firm, you know, Quadratic 10 years ago is to give people a positive asymmetry in their bond portfolio instead of just that, that negative payout um, through these other kind of older, older instruments. Yeah, and then uh, you said, what, what is the Fed's plan? I, I want to use one of uh, Sam's favorite sayings on that. They're just going to ride it until the wheels fall off, right? It just, I mean, that's what they're going to do. They're going to let it grind down until it's a problem, you know. But uh, I know Sam wanted to get a little bit more on the business side of things, too, real quick. So, Sam, why don't I tee you up for that before we kick it over to the favorite part of the show? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Nancy, and then you were talking about just now, 10 years. I mean, congratulations on that. Uh, definitely, yeah. I'm sure you've seen your ups and downs there, but just wanted to hear as a business owner out there in, in finance, you know, what were some of the challenges you faced, you know, starting your company and then really going between managing these portfolios, thinking about these new ideas, but at the same time, the daily task of keeping a, a business sustainable and running as well. So just you know, some, some tidbits that you, you, you would care to share and, you know, things that you've learned along the way. You know, I, uh, I enjoyed, uh, kind of trying to, in my view, I want a better client outcomes. I want to give investors more choices and it's been just a pleasure to create my own firm and to manage, you know, positive, uh, long volatility strategies in fixed income. Cause there's, you know, before, us, it was really uh, very hard for investors to access, you know, a single QCIP product that that did that, that that gave that that positive convexity profile. So I really, I really enjoyed, uh, you know, the process creating my firm. I think going to challenges like we are there, there are more ETFs than stocks. It is it is a you know, huge ocean, and it's an oligopoly. Like if we can call it what it is, there are a couple of very large. ETF issues that dominate the market. And so it's definitely really hard as a, you know, I would say like no name firm <laughs> competing in an oligopoly industry. It's probably the most competitive industry to compete in. And I think challenges like we, we don't have, you know, um, you know, the reach to all the, you know, some, some, a lot of the wealth management platforms have gatekeepers, right? And they don't onboard even though it's listed on the stock exchange, you know, Eyeball and BNDD trade on the New York Stock Exchange, you know, a financial advisor at XYZ firm can't buy it necessarily because it's not onboarded, whatever that means, um, onto a platform. So I think that's been kind of the biggest frustration as I sort of like, you know, it's a uh, it feels a little bit like an old boys network to me still with these uh, these kind of like entry into the wealth management firms and I want to grab people. I'm like, you're, you know, they hear, you know, Eyeball has a really long name, right? It's called the Quadratic Interest Rate Volatility and Inflation Hedge ETF. And people hear that and they're like, oh my gosh, it's got, you know, derivatives and blah, blah, blah. And I try to, I'm like, look, your, your short duration fund is like got structured credit and half of it's triple B minus credit. Corporate hey, don't, credit. Bash my, don't bash our structured credit funds here. Our low no, no, I'm not bashing structured credit. I'm just like, that's complicated stuff too, but it's all over the place. This is just different. So it's not, I'm not bashing structured credit. I'm not bashing those products. I'm just trying to give people other choices. And I think one frustration that I've had with kind of going down the ETF channel is the access. The access is really hard for a, you know, not mainstream issuer uh, like us to, to get, to be available. You know, it's like, it's like a grocery store. You know, if you're not on the shelf, people don't know about it. And we're, we're uh, bottom shelf at best. <laughs> so, <laughs> right now. Well, I'd like to point out in all of this, of all your self-deprecation, if you, uh, as an issuer, Quadratic is larger than double line in terms of assets under management in the ETF complex. So but we've we been doing two. it longer. <laughs> we've been doing we it longer. Two. You have too. I just want to point that out. So I, I think you've done a, a very good job, at least in our eyes. And, you know, um, I, I recall our conversation from almost four years ago, the other things you want to achieve. And I've always rooted for you on the sidelines. So congratulations, Nancy. 
Um, you know, I think you've done a wonderful job. The education of the masses is important. And, you know, we're happy to have you back here. But as I said, with all those platitudes comes a payment to us. And that is Sam's favorite part of the show. So, Sam. <laughs> All right. And that part, favorite part of the show is called Sherman Says. Nancy, you know this. It's uh, where I will offer a series of alternating prompts between you and Sherman, to which I hope to give a top of mind response. Uh, I'm going to give it out to Sherman first with macro investing. Hard. Over to you, Nancy, with unidentified flying objects. <laughs> Distraction. Back to Sherm with super core inflation. Wasn't super low today. That was probably the thing that's the scariest. So this new super core, or as uh, what we would call it around here, is core services uh, X shelter. Um, to get really technical, there uh, does not seem to be improving at this stage. So um, if, even though this is Jay's new favorite measure, it does not signal uh, that they are necessarily done at this stage in the hiking cycle, which is what we talked about, the highest terminal rate we've seen today at this point in the cycle. And just to throw in, I don't mean to mess up the, but like participation rate, a lot of, we're going to election year, a lot of states are sending inflation relief checks in the mail, you know, which are very well-meaning policy, but you have to kind of think, you know, think in the long game, what does that do to the labor force and participation? Wait, on top of that, Sam, did we ever get our inflation, like energy check? Remember, wasn't Gavin supposed to mail us some of those? No, did you I didn't receive my, I was looking forward to spending it and perhaps adding to some of this inflation fire as well, but I didn't get to do it, so. <laughs> All right, I don't recall either. So we need to, we need to call him and see what's going on with that. Yeah. Another thing, actually, since you're talking about the highest terminal rate in some time, uh, I'm looking at the six month T-bill. It's still at a uh, five handle here. So it looks like yeah. it managed that close, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. Across the point, screen, it's it for you guys, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. So let's see here. Where were we? Okay. Nancy, over to you with launching new products. Hard. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> Back to you, Sherm, with... Uh, yeah, I have to agree with that, Nancy. Yeah, we're, we're like 22 <laughs> in, and not, it doesn't get any, any easier, I'll tell you that, so. Wow, 22, that's, you guys are going at it hard, <laughs> pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> All right, back to you, Sherm, with uh, early look, and this is with a nod towards uh, Jay Powell's comment on his super secret economic data. <laughs> uh can't we all just get the data at the same time? You know, like, you know, um, you know, it used to be the old joke is one of the Wall Street firms got in front of everyone. And, uh, you know, it's pretty interesting, too, for all the early looks and everything. We were off on inflation today. The market liked it at first. And it said, wait a second, super core. And I think that's because the ECST screen, the economic statistics screen in Bloomberg was shut down for all of us. We were blaming double line. We were all trying to look. I think everyone's trying to look to get into that super core because it's not in the traditional other areas and we couldn't get to it for like 10 minutes. So maybe that's what, uh, you know, maybe be, there's no more early leaks and therefore they got to slow down the dissemination of the data. Anyway, don't right. Back to you, Nancy, with hedge funds. Compensation schemes. That's what I'd say. I, I, like, I honestly, I, I, I really do think public securities, like if you like eyeball BNDD, they buy treasuries and fully funded options, charging incentive fees, which are, you know, we, you know, make money off of when you make money and higher management fees, I think is going to be a thing. Like I think the wrapper or the fund should match the underlying asset that it owns. So I, uh, I do, I do feel really good about, you know, giving investors more choices at lower fees um so we were uh we were nicknamed the uh vanguard of convexity strategies i hope vanguard doesn't sue me but that the quoting a client <laughs> all right uh, i don't know why i just glanced down at the uh, square that has our compliance officer <laughs> compliance. i know right compliance, <laughs> compliance person out here wait that out <laughs> She's like, you guys talk about convexity a lot on this show a lot, you know? I know. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's Anything see. you can be long and short. That's a that's a thing. You can, uh, there's always two sides to everything. 
Let's see here. Sherman, don't fight the Fed. Been telling you. You know, I've been telling you. You know, this is the whole thing is don't fight the tape, don't fight the Fed. Right now, the tape and the Fed are at odds with each other. And, you know, again, to Nancy's point, the, this shape of the curve signals that, you know, look, bad things are going to happen. And so, you know, again, given some of the economic data and some of the strength we've seen in some of the consumer data and the labor markets, again, albeit with the lag that we all know about, um, I, I, I'm starting to say that, like, look, I'm not changing and saying this time is different. I just said that the market is signaling to the Fed that it's too tight. You know, and so I can I can justify that. Um, but as I as I've argued with some folks internally, we're sitting roughly at a 375.10 here on February 14th, 2023. Since Nancy said it three times, I got at least get my second one in. Um, I'm but spending three, three, my Valentine's Day with you guys. So it's a we needed one. You know, and so the thing is, is that you know, at 375, is that recessionary? Well, it wasn't when we had 375 and, you know, six months ago and in normal shape curve, to Nancy's point, this upward sloping, right? But so why is it now? I don't know. Um, but we definitely know that, you know, the Fed policy has been very tight and the market's signaling that. So, um, again, um, I got on a little rant there, Sam, so I'll, I'll stop. I'm, I'm accustomed to it now. So I'm going to pass it back to Nancy here before you start up again with rolling recessions. You know, it's recessions happen, right? I think the the challenge is when. It's not a question of if. It's you know when. Um, and I think markets are saying the rates market is priced for a recession. Equities and credit aren't. And so my point is, is like, if you don't think there's a recession, you should own some yield curve steepeners because it's priced for one. <laughs> so, yeah. right. And on top of that, you know, if you think about it too. I think the yield curve is still signaling recession, but your point, Nancy, when is it? If we have in 10 years, it's going to say the yield curve is right once again, right? You know, um, but uh, I guess there is some timing mechanism to it. But um, uh, I agree with you that uh, I kind of like the steepener trade today. All right, let's go to the final rounds. Last one uh, for each of you here. Sherman's, yours is going to be rock band, favorite rock band. Guns N' Roses. All right. And last one to wrap us all up here, Nancy, your prompt is bass guitar. Oh, I, uh, I know you guys know this, but I am um, my uh, my father is a uh, jazz musician. So I grew up playing uh, the bass and uh, I played in uh, in high school. I was the uh, the stand up bassist for our high school orchestra. And that was part of how I randomly started doing uh, CNBC was that connection. So always, always be nice to everyone. The golden rule, we learned it in uh, in kindergarten. Yeah. yeah, I think that's the best thing to all our listeners out there. Be nice to everybody. Uh, if there's one thing you can get out of this podcast besides convexity, you know, steepeners, <laughs> ball trades, it's definitely be nice to your fellow uh, fellow humans, let's say. They're fellow not humans. Right, exactly. So, Especially uh, theater nerds in high school. <laughs> Right. Uh, I guess maybe we were, we were a little too picked on all of us uh, in high school. Not not. Oh, I'm very bruised. I'm very bruised from that whole experience. But hey, we probably wouldn't be thinking about convexity and all this stuff if we were just normal, right? <laughs> so. yeah. Right, because uh, normal distribution doesn't get you there. So um, nope. there's another math joke embedded in that. So anyway, thanks, Nancy. It's always a pleasure. Congratulations on the success you've had since the last time you've been on the Sherman Show. I'm sure those two things are not correlated, but <laughs> if, you, if you have significant success from here, you know, we may have to take a little bit of credit once again. So again, thank you for spending the time with us. Happy Valentine's Day. Um, thank you to all our listeners out there. I uh, hope you enjoyed this episode. Again, if there's more you'd like to hear uh, about Nancy and her strategies, Nancy, what's the best way they can get in touch with you? Um, so we have um, probably our fund websites. It's uh, it's eyeball, and I don't mean eyeball. People, when I say it, it's I like interest rate volatility, I-V-O-L, ETF.com, and then our other fund, Deflation. I think you like the name of this one. I called it a BND D. Double D. Bond, yeah, right. It's a bond for deflation. For deflation, of course. Yeah, right. Of course, of course. So, so all right. 
So again, for our listeners out there, again, you can, uh, this is Nancy Davis from Quadratic Capital, the founder, um, and again, her products out there that you've seen as she's talked about much today, IVOL and BNDD. So again, you can catch this on our YouTube channel. You can see all of our hand signals about the inversion, the uninversion, the steepeners, the flatteners. Um, that's youtube.com backslash double line capital. Um, and you can also uh, listen to these podcasts wherever uh, you, you get those served from. Uh, Sam knows all of them with his moonlighting gig on his other podcast called Double Line Morning Min uh, Monday Morning Minutes, which now gets released on Friday. And so uh, what a bad name for a podcast, Sam. Um, again, you should have done something like the Sherman Show, or at least people know what it is. So anyway, thanks again, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, tune in in a couple of weeks as we'll have a new guest as well. And again, thanks to Nancy Davis. Thank you, guys. Happy Valentine's. Yeah, you as well. I love the hat in the background. It was perfect for the day. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Like that. Yeah.